is Christian Mergia. I am the manager of public programs with the York County History Center. And really, really, I'd like to say thank you uh, for coming out to a debut of a brand new program, Hidden Histories. You guys are the first, so give yourself a round. <laughs> to set the stage here tonight, with the passing of time, many of the stories that are told become forgotten. Many of the people who have walked the streets of York, the same ones we all walk today, have been forgotten, lost time, just as anything else. However, sometimes these people are kept alive by living family members. Others are hidden, only to be found through research. Libraries, archives, historical and oral records are all time capsules that preserve the stories and histories of the people of our not-so-distant past. There are people in York today that know some of these histories that have been forgotten. And it's the duty of all of us to know and recognize the histories of those who came before us, especially if those histories have been hidden. Guy Dunn is a Presbyterian minister who served various congregations for 40 years until his retirement in 2017. He also served as executive director of the York County Council of Churches from 2008 to 2010. He is married to Susan Dunn, and both attend worship at and are actively involved in the life and ministry of First Presbyterian Church. Guy will be sharing the story of David Edder Small, an advocate for freedom seekers in the 1800s. So without further ado, my friend, Thanks, Christian. Uh, thank you for all coming this evening. Um, we've been talking about this for a long time since I did a uh, presentation at the History Center some time ago about Faith Presbyterian Church, which was the only black Presbyterian congregation in New York and uh, with which First Presbyterian merged in 1965. And uh, I'll have to do that one again. I haven't even done that one here. <laughs> so I still need to do it here in First Presbyterian. Yeah, Rich, I need to do it. Um, but anyway, I, I really want to thank the uh, York County History Center for inviting me to present this evening, especially giving me the honor to uh, basically kick off uh, in histories as I said, um, Christian and I have been talking about it for quite a while. He sat down with me and said, Guy, I've got some ideas. And he knew um, I had this thing for David Edder Small. And he said, I really, can you talk more about him? And I said, well, he's a fascinating guy. And everybody thinks in terms of Philip A. Albright Small and Samuel and Isabel Small. But nobody knows about David Edder Small. And I think if you don't, you'll be surprised what part of him is still very evident here in York. And you didn't even know it, most likely. So anyway, um, I also need to thank Jim McClure. Um, Jim McClure has become a real friend of mine. He's an expert. If you know anything about his writing, he knows so much about York County history. And he has been such a good mentor with me and also a source of information. So um, that's been invaluable. I want to thank KG Gorin, Kyle back there. He's the tech guy here, director of communications and media at First Presbyterian. And then finally, I want to thank my wife, Susan, who's also seated back there. She has her clicker in hand, so I don't have to try to coordinate. I don't do well talking and clicking. And because she has already done such a good job in practice, she has received the honor of being referred to as my click chick. <laughs> so thank you, honey. I, I really <laughs> Before I begin, I want to clear up some possible confusion. We should note that I will be using the name English Presbyterian Church the entire time, as that was the name of this congregation between 1785, when the agreement was first formed between the heirs of William and, and the three men who purchased the land. It was referred to as the English Presbyterian Church at Stuck and had been called that all the way until um, 
the 19, around 1900. I'm not really sure the reason why, but I have my own suspicions as to why it was called Change to First Presbyterian, maybe because there were three other Presbyterian churches in the area by then, and they wanted to make sure that nobody confused the fact that they were the very first. <laughs> but I have to check with Joe Lo, uh, Lobach. He is doing a complete history of First Presbyterian. He tells me it will be 700 pages long, he believes, when it's complete. So, um, anyway. I also need to tell you that over the last year, David Edder Small has become one of my heroes for a variety of reasons. The obvious is due to the fact that when I'm not in the choir loft, I always insist, and Susan knows it, that we sit in the pew that lines up with his memorial window in um, the sanctuary. I don't know if anybody at First Presbyterian noticed that, but you'll notice it now. That that's where we usually sit. Um, he is one of those people, as I've learned more about him, that you wish you could have known personally. Now, he's not the kind of person you could say, I'd like to sit down and have a beer with, because he was a teetotaler. So you wouldn't say that. But he is the kind of person I would have loved to have met. And someday, and by and by, I hope we will get to meet each other. Um, and if I've done my job right tonight, then I hope that you will feel the same way as I do. When David Ederspall died in 1883, it was reported by the local papers that his memorial service was perhaps the largest ever held in York. With the sanctuary filled to capacity, the middle section of the pews at English Presbyterian Church was totally occupied but by a fraction of his employees. It was said that he was often quick to warmly correct them when necessary, insisting that they call him David rather than Mr. Small. The day after his passing, the York Daily wrote, A complete history by human pen of such a life as his cannot be written. We can tell of his birth and death, and of the successes and honors that came between, but the sympathetic word and aid to the sufferers, the influence of his counsel, and the encouragement of his example cannot be printed. Their record is in the grateful hearts of those whose eyes are filled with tears as they recount his virtues and tell of his manifold benefactions. It was in 1743 when Lorenz Schmall immigrated from his German home and settled in the rolling farmland of central York County. The region, along with the Hanover and York areas, was more favored by the Germans than were the southeastern regions to where the Scot-Irish were drawn. Or the northern tier of the county were Christians for primary settlers. According to histor historian Daniel Bob, shortly after his arrival, it appeared that Lorenz anglicized his surname to Small, and as a result, the original form of Schmall completely disappeared. Over time, the Small family name would evolve into a highly prominent one in York and well beyond. But equally prominent in the county would be the <coughs> undeniable and at times public divergent views with this expansive family regarding the positions on the role of government, slavery, freedom seekers, presidential candidates, and eventually the Civil War itself. Indicative, if not a casualty, of the growing divide in families and community alike was the fact that sometime in the 1830s, several small family members, including Philip Albright and Samuel, left the German Reformed Church in which they were baptized and united with English Presbyterian Church. Considering that both congregations were within the Reformed tradition, it was probably not a difficult transition for the smalls. Church records indicate, however, that all of Philip 
and Sarah's ten children, starting in 1823, were baptized by Reverend Robert Cathcart, pastor of the Presbyterian Congregation since 1793. Sarah Latimer Small, being of the Latimer family, had already been a member of English Presbyterian. Philip's brother Samuel united with English Presbyterian in 1839. His wife, Isabel Cassatt, was already a member, along with her well-known parents, attorney David A. and Margaret Cassatt. It was at the young age of 13 in 1837 that David and her small left the York County Academy to work at the mercantile business of his father's cousins, Philip Albright and Samuel. During the nine years of his employment at PANS Small, he lived with Samuel and Isabel, attending the German Reformed Church with him and eventually English Presbyterian, most likely upon Samuel and Isabel's transfer of membership. Later in life, he would fondly attest to, quote, how much my subsequent career has been affected by the intellectual and the spiritual stimulus he received while living with Samuel and Isabel. No doubt his experience with the tremendously successful business owners provided an invaluable education that would contribute to his own business success. It would no doubt come in handy when, quote, under promptings of filial duty, unquote, David left PA and S. Small to join his father Henry and to manage the lumber business in 1845 at the young age of 21. With his father's business apparently struggling financially, David set up a motto in his office, NRG, energy, because he was convinced that coming to his father's assistance would, quote, require the diligent use of all my power to put the company's affairs on a secure business, unquote. Well, apparently the inspiring motto worked as the business grew to the point that eventually both David's younger brothers, John and Jacob, were brought on board to help manage what would become the famous H. Small and Sons Lumber Company. And yet, never forgetting his spiritual moorings, on Sunday, May 3rd, 1846, David wrote in his diary, This day I confess my God and Savior before the world. Many who knew him, including his eventual pastor, the Reverend Dr. Henry E. Niles, attested to and highly respected David's deep faith, as, the way, as well as the ways in which he faithfully lived it out. He strictly held to honoring the Sabbath, and was a strong proponent of the temperance movement. That's why he can't sit down and have a beer. <laughs> but more than that, what stood out for those who spoke so admirably of him, was that he showed himself to be a man of deep compassion, especially for the less fortunate, even showing tears in his eyes as he would hear their sad stories. So compassionate was he, Niles said it was even to a fault. As Niles would later write of him, love of money is the prevailing spirit of our age, and too often the more a man gets, the less he gives the more stern and hard and illiberal he grows. But through grace, he overcame that spiritual enemy. And the richer he grew, the kinder, more benevolent, and more beneficent he became. In 1849, David Edder Small and his new wife, Mary Fulton, would leave the German Reformed congregation of his parents and join his other relatives at English Presbyterian by transfer of letter. At some point, his father, Henry, and his mother joined the congregation as well. Which begs the question, why did some members of such a prominent family as the Smalls leave the church where their ancestors had worshipped for decades? Some surmise that it may have been related to a rift that developed within the congregation regarding the pastor's seeming southern sympathies. However, other than speculation, the actual reason for their departure appears to be left to the ages. J. 
just the same. Even as the tensions over slavery and abolition of the institution grew in the county, so did the economy and industries in the expanding town of York. At the turn of the century in 1800, York was one of the top 100 most populous regions in the young nation. As agriculture continued to expand across the county's rich farmland, the need for grain mills and other types of related industries grew. In addition, with the invention of the coal-powered locomotive by York citizen, Phineas Davis, and the expansion of the Northern Central Railway from Baltimore into York, across the Lancaster and beyond, the need for rail cars and other related industries also emerged. Industries that have long been part of the landscape, such as iron ore furnaces and lumber yards, etc., benefited as well. Family names such as Small, Billmeyer, Goodrich, Bauer and Wolf, Farquhar, among others, became well known in the county as its chief employers and industrialists, as well as being its movers and its shapers. At one point, one sixth of all the freight being shipped by the Northern Central Railroad between York and Baltimore <coughs> was attributed to PA and S. Small. And one third of all the grain grown in the county was purchased by them, with it then being sent to customers located as far away as London and Brazil. Now, two businessmen who profited handsomely from the burgeoning railroad industry were rail car manufacturers, Charles Billmeyer, that should look very familiar to you all, whose gracious home was built around 1860 and now houses First Presbyterian's carrying ministry. And 28-year-old David Edder Small, who would become a partner with Bill Meyer in 1852. The name and reputation of a highly successful railroad car manufacturing company would become as well known across the country as did the name of David E. Small. At its peak, the company would employ over 700 workers, not to speak of others, who were also employed in additional businesses owned by David E. Small. Nonetheless, many attested to the fact that attaining success at such an early age did not cause Small to follow the path of many who knew equal financial success. As Henry E. Niles would later note, it was also faith in God by which our brother overcame that evil spirit, which in case of so many who achieve their own fortune, makes them appear haughty and unsympathetic towards others. Everybody saw that he was modest and unassuming before his fellow men, full of kindly impulses and of generous, delicate deeds. His long life as master, it has been well said, was one of patient kindness and generosity. No harshness entered into his rule. No severity guided his action, though firmness was one of his sterling qualities. Now owned by Martin Library, Small built his brownstone house in 1866, just on the west side of where the library now stands. How many of you knew that? I didn't think so. <laughs> Years later, Henry E. Niles would recount how upon its completion, and before any guests had visited the house, David E. Small asked that Niles and the church elders with their wives join him and his family in a meal. Afterward, the spacious home was filled with the songs of praise, the reading of Psalm 30, and with each person there offering prayers, thereby dedicating the stately brownstone to the glory of God and for God's use. During this time of tremendous industrial growth, the ongoing relationship between York County and Baltimore's harbor, not to speak of states farther south, was extremely important, not only for York County's growing economy, but for the economy of the eastern and the northern states as well. In reality, the south's thriving cotton industry among other cash crops, had become extremely beneficial 
to northern cities. But there was no denying that the South's economy was heavily dependent upon slave labor. And thereby, by extension, so was the northern states. And although slavery had been outlawed by all the states north of the Mason-Dixon line, the abolitionist movement itself was not always popular, even above that line, including in York. By the time the war began, David Enter Small was more than willing to go and fight for the Union cause. Unlike many of those who would march off to war, his reasons were far more than just loyalty to the North. Rather, his motivation went deeper, to end once and for all the abhorrent institution of slavery in the United States. Henry Niles noted in his biographical sketch of David Small's life, he took a great interest in the colored race, believing not only that justice and harmony required all possible efforts to ameliorate their condition, but also that they are capable of Christian education equal with whites. There was only one thing that disqualified Small from serving his country, according to the Union Army. David Edder Small had only one arm. Hmm. Look at the picture. Back in 1853, one year after he and Charles Fillmire had formed the famous rail car company, tragedy struck. As his pastor described the scene, in 1853, when conducting a gentleman through their shops, his clothing was caught in a rapidly revolving machinery, and he sustained a fearful accident in the loss of his right arm. But in a few weeks, I can't believe this, his vigorous constitution rallied from the shop so that he was able to resume his wanted activities. Niles would later recount from witnesses at the scene of how, in spite of the excruciating pain and the obvious temptation to lose consciousness, he was heard, if ever so weakly, to whisper, I am so glad it was not one of the men. Was it any wonder as to why his employees often spoke of him, not only with such respect, but also deep affection? But why? Why, less than a decade later, should the loss of an arm disqualify him from serving his country in his greatest need? And so David argued, if I can bring down a partridge with my gun, I certainly can shoot well enough to go in the defense of my country. <laughs> well, obviously, in spite of his deep commitment to the cause, the Union Army did not agree. A history of the York Academy, the institution of which Small was a trustee, indicates that after not one, not two, but three unsuccessful attempts to join the Union Army, he resorted to serving in some form of secret service work. Just the same, Small's hatred of legalized human bondage <coughs> and his commitment to helping any freedom seeker, perhaps some suspect, had been demonstrated long before the war began. For by building railroad cars, it appears that Bill Meyer and Small's company, just like William Goodrich's company, may have been transporting more than normal cargo, as it was suspected there was human cargo hidden in those rail cars as well. Now, their well-known cousin, David Small, and that's why you have to be very careful, friends. One is David E. Small, the other one is David Small. Different family lines. He was the owner and editor of the York Gazette, and was one of those who took an opposite position regarding abolition. As Jim McClure himself writes, the prevailing political view in the county at the start of the Civil War can best be summed up by the Copperhead mantra. The Union as it was, the Constitution as it is, and the Negroes where they are. 
The Copperheads, or Peace Democrats, weren't exactly pro-slavery, but they weren't exactly anti-slavery either. They didn't believe breaking the bonds of a race of people justified splitting the Union. They took a decidedly state rights point of view. Does that sound familiar? I call it union busting, so to speak, was not the only concern that these Democrats, like David Small, had in regard to standing over and against the South. For many of the northern states, and York County was certainly a prime example, had an economy that was directly tied to and even depended upon regular and open commerce with the southern states. For York and the surrounding county, it was no small economic factor to take into consideration in light of the fact that the Northern Central Railroad ran from Baltimore right to New York and on to the east. Even strong Republican business families, such as PANS Small and David Edder Small, had benefited greatly by this fact, and thereby could be adversely affected financially by opposing the South in its cause. By early spring, word was spreading that Lee's army was moving up toward the Mason-Dixon line with the intention of invading Pennsylvania. On June 16, it became a reality as the Confederates entered just south of Chambersburg and met with a weak defense from Union troops. Their ultimate goal was to reach and capture the state capital of Harrisburg, thereby making a profound military invasion into northern territory. David Small, not David E., but David Small, now Chief Burgess, or Mayor of York, had called a meeting held in the offices of PA and S. Small to discuss the defense of the city and to beef up recruitment of volunteers in light of the impending Confederate invasion of York County. The following account of a subsequent meeting was reported by historian John Gibson. Gibson. He writes, The Committee of Safety of the Borough of York, organized in June 1863 for the defense of the Borough of York, for the information of the public, published the following statement. <coughs> On Monday evening, the 15th of June, 1863, at the call of the Chief Burgess, a large meeting was held in the courthouse, which resulted in the appointment of the following safety committee. Among the 15 men assigned to five different city wards was David Edder Small. Long after, not long after, Confederate troops were beginning to cross the Mason-Dixon line into southwestern regions of Adams and York counties. Just like their Union counterparts in the South, they began pillaging farms and small villages in search of fresh horses, chickens and hogs to slaughter, grain to bake bread, shoes to replace the worn out ones. Word of the imminent invasion spread, and citizens began hiding valuables, some placing them in grain bags and lowering them into wells, others hid their treasures in nearby streams and brush. In York itself, shoemaker and elder at English Presbyterian Church, Jacob Emmett, which by the way, that's his window back there in the corner, ran back and forth to the building of cabinet maker Colonel George Hay next door, hiding all his leather goods in none other than empty caskets. By June 27, as the reality of an invasion of York became undeniable, Citizens of the city and outlying regions began packing up as much as they could on horses, wagons, or simply left on foot, and fled to the River Bridge in Wrightsville, seeking refuge in nearby Lancaster County and beyond. Thousands of citizens gathered their valuables, livestock, and horses, and headed for safety across the broad Susquehanna. In Wrightsville, Throughout much of Saturday, June 27, a massive traffic jam of refugees stretched westward toward Helena. Each awaited his turn to pay the required toll to cross the covered bridge to Lancaster County. 
Among those fleeing was David Edder Small's family. His great great daughter Liz Lennon would remark years later. He eventually felt his family would be safer with the Philadelphia relatives, so he loaded them in their carriage, made it for the Wrightsville Bridge, and was one of the last passenger carriages to cross the bridge before it was burned. However, David E. Small, now a member of the safety committee, did not go with them, but stayed behind. A year before the Civil War ended, the fiery abolitionist preacher, Reverend Thomas Street, resigned his position at English Presbyterian and became the third pastor of North Presbyterian Church, located in New York City. With his departure, English Presbyterian's leaders began to search for a new pastor, one whose eventual tenure would prove to become the second longest pastorate in the church's history. His call would also begin as the nation was not only reeling from the catastrophic effects of its recent civil war, but also the horrific assassination of its iconic president. It was within a post-war environment in which Reverend Dr. Henry E. Niles would also seek to lead his congregation into resuming some sort of normalcy. Indicative of his abilities and personality, the congregation almost quadrupled in size during his 35 years as pastor, growing from 115 to 500 members. But also in 1865, the year of Niles' installation, David Edder Small was ordained and installed as an elder, thereby serving on the session with none other than his cousin, Samuel Small. In addition, he became known not only as a dedicated Sunday school teacher, but also as one who never hesitated to attest to the faith that was his in Jesus Christ. He would often urge friend, colleague, employee, or stranger alike to receive the salvation offered to them in Christ and to pray to them to that end. It was once said of David E. Small that he was so broad-minded and high-hearted, so full of divine fire, that the coldest natures felt the warmth of his sympathetic presence and admired his loyalty to Christ and the church. In 1854, a year after David E. Small lost his arm in that industrial accident, Presbyterian minister, Reverend John Miller Dickey, along with his first black students, brothers James and Thomas Amos, founded Ashland Institute in Chester County, Pennsylvania. They named it after Jehudai Ashland, a religious leader and social reformer. As the nation's first degree-granting historically black college and university, Ashland Institute paved the path to higher education for African-American males, which had been previously unavailable to them. In 1866, a year after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, Ashman Institute was renamed Lincoln University. The college attracted highly talented black students from numerous states, especially during long decades of legal segregation in the South. It would be noted almost two decades later, that upon his death, David Edder Small left, among other previous monetary gifts to the college, a large sum of money to the university, with Small's bequest amounting approximately the equivalent of $320,000. Small's generous donation came as no surprise, as he had been known for providing financial assistance to various individual black students who wanted to attend the school but could not afford it themselves. In 1873, strat tragedy would, would strike the small family when his eldest daughter, Annie, died after suffering a number of years with ill health. Always hoping that somehow she might be spared David E. Small was devastated by her passing. In retrospect, some believe that it was this difficult loss that caused his once robust 
an energetic constitution to wane. In 1875, Small suffered another personal loss in the unexpected death of his business partner, Charles Billmeyer, at the young age of 51. Ignoring pleas for him to slow down, one year later, David E. Small suffered what may have been a nervous breakdown, the effects of which would plague him until his death. Personal loss then would strike a third time seven years later in 1882 when his other daughter Molly and the wife of William H. McClellan died after a long illness. Although with what seemed to be a renewed energy, and even as David E. Small made every attempt to proclaim his faith in his daughter's ultimate healing, it became increasingly obvious that this blow was taking an insurmountable toll on him. The following year, in February of 1883, feeling the pressure to secure enough business to keep his hundreds of workmen employed, he made a hurried trip to Boston, only to return with what at first appeared to be a very bad cold. Instead, it turned out to be an untreatable case of typhoid pneumonia. For over a month, Small would struggle with rapid declining health. And then on Monday, March 26, 1883, the York Daily reported the death of David E. Small as having occurred the day before at 9 a.m. on none other than Easter morning. In part, the article read as follows. His death seems like an irreparable loss, but York may well be proud that it has such men to lose. It is a boon for a town that its young men have examples like the life of David E. Small to incite them to manly effort and to preach so forcibly of the rewards, temporal and eternal, of those who are diligent in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. In an age of sensuality and brutish materialism, his character is a shining light to those to lead those who have any aspirations up into a higher region of principle and pure atmosphere of sentiment. For all who knew him will be better. Such a man has lived and left so sweet a memory and so exalted an example. David Edder Small died just prior to his 59th year. And although his final resting place is in Prospect Hill Cemetery, rather than the English Presbyterian Church graveyard with his other famous relatives, he nevertheless was remembered by those whom he had helped over the decades. This was particularly the case with the black community. For upon his death, a community directory stated, Mr. Small took a deep interest in the welfare of the colored people, many a time giving them pecuniary aid and a helping hand on their way to freedom. And so in remembrance of those kindnesses, the colored soldiers of York have named their post David E. Small Post, number 369, G-A-R. And perhaps it could be said there has been no greater description of, nor tribute to, the life of David Edder Small than that one simple yet profound gesture of gratitude. Thank you. Which they acquired 
several years ago. I was lucky enough to know somebody who works there who got me in the house so I could take those two pictures of the entryway and the yeah. dining hall because nobody's allowed in there. That's where the offices are. And it's Paula Gilbert. I was her pastor years ago in Lancaster. And I got a hold of her. Actually, you and I were having lunch that day, sir, Ryan. And I saw her and I was like, oh my gosh, that's the Paula. And so I asked her and she said, I can get you in there. So she got me in there to take the pictures. And it's been, I think they said they spent $800,000 to renovate the house. And it's now, as you know, connected to Mark Library. The offices are in the second and third floors. And the first floor is maintained? Just like what you saw, that's what it looks like. That, it's gorgeous. Wasn't that Henry Blattner's photography studio for a number of years? It may have been. It went through several hands before it finally came to the library. Yeah. Yeah. And the false scrap, Susquehanna false scrap. I worked at that building. Yes. So probably Louis Appel had acquired it at one point. Because he saw the value in it. That's who Louis was. Yeah. And he saw the value and then he made sure that it didn't get demolished. Just like the Millmeyer house. We won't talk about how almost it got demolished. <laughs> you can ask somebody from First Presbyterian that story if you don't know it. But anyway, if you go in, it's amazing because there's frescoes in there in David's house, but also in the Bill Meyer house, the same frescoes painted by the same men who painted the frescoes in the National Capitol building. So these are people, folks, who had money. They were extremely wealthy and well-to-do. But David, at her small, was humble, nevertheless. Anyone else? This doesn't relate to your presentation, I don't think. <coughs> but the the uh, story or the history of the Underground Railroad, is that going to be part of this series of, of programs that you're offering? I uh, hope so. Yeah. It's, it's beginning to it's, unravel more. Scott Mendes has done an incredible job in researching your county's <coughs> involvement with the uh, under yeah. Railroad. And he was the one who, <coughs> who uh, tipped me off to the fact that David Edder Small may well have been a part of it. That's where, that's where, yeah. And, and when you consider the fact that he and William Goodrich were contemporaries, they were businessmen, they both built rail cars, they knew each other. And people involved in the Underground Railroad didn't write it down because it was a federal offense. Mm -hmm. So we don't always really know who was involved. We only know by certain things. Well, think of it this way, folks. Why? And, and nobody can tell me of any other post has been named. Why would the black veterans of the Civil War name their post after a white man unless they knew exactly what he had been doing? And then on top of it, then the contributions to their education. So, yeah, he was well known and understood uh, who he was in the black community. Yeah. Yes, sir. My grandfather, who lived uh, North Queen, almost to Arch Street, was an engineer uh, during his time between York and Frederick. And I, was, I, I, I can't. I, I don't have a picture of him actually leaning out of the, the steam engine, you know. I would love to have it, but that begs a question. Might have he pulled some of those cards? Now that might have been not so always a, the ones with the uh, space for, for with the locomotive. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. As I said before, the, the smalls, Philip Albright and Samuel, Samuel particularly in Isabel, because incredible contributions they made to York County in regard to uh, York College, the institute before that, the Children's Home of York, uh, York Hospital, um, what he, they did in philanthropy. And she also, upon her death, Samuel died first, she also left money to Lincoln University. Not as much as David did, but she did very well. And, um, but unfortunately, David Ettersmall kind of got uh, hidden, if you will, in their shadow. Did I see it? Yeah. 
Yeah. His wife died, but did the math right at the age of about 23. Excuse me? His wife passed away at the age of 23. That was his daughter. That was his daughter, okay. Yeah, that was Annie. And then Molly, and I could not find where she's buried with the phone. I tried on find a grave and everything. And I do not know, but if somebody knows, I'd love to find out. And did you know the cause of death from his daughter that died at 23? It was a link, long term in, uh, illness, that's all they said. I don't really know what exactly okay. it was. It may be recorded somewhere, but I haven't read anything. He also had a son, David, David Edder Small Jr. But you never hear about poor David. <laughs> well, we do. We have some things in the archives about him. And, uh, because he continued um, Bill Myron Small after both those first men died. He continued. Yes? I have two questions. The railroad ran from Baltimore north, or did it hook in before, lower, south, more southern than Baltimore? I, that part I don't know. Now, I'm sure it did because it all connected the southern, deep southern states all the way over the Mason-Dixon line, so there are probably a confluence of railroads. But the northern, which is still in existence, you can ride it today. Yeah. And what was his company called that ran the what would it be now? I mean, what, what did his, the progression of the company? A Bill Myron Small? Yeah. They eventually Well, TAN Small. PAN, they, they all went out of business eventually over time. Oh, so they're, they're, they're all out of business? Yeah, they're, they're oh. all in existence. I, I think that's not uncommon. Generationally, eventually, the generations don't keep it going anymore. And PAN Small was mercantile? Was, or they were a number. They were in the lumber business. Grant, they, transportation of grains, uh, as I said, uh, they were in a number of different. And they figured very prominently in the invasion of the Confederates. Jim McClure writes of it. Um, Early was trying to extort York in a variety of ways. And one of it was that he threatened to burn, that they had done it previously. And the story is that Philip Albright Small went out and offered him $100,000. <coughs> But he said, you'll have to take 50 first, and then I'll have to draw the rest on the bank. <laughs> and right then, the writer rode up to Early and said, you need to get back to Gettysburg. So Philip Albright Small never had to pay because they went back and fought the famous battle. <laughs> Years later, Early wrote to Small and said, you still owe me $100,000. <laughs> <laughs> Any others? I would just say that this was a very interesting and informative kickoff to yes. your new program. Yes. And these people always sit across the aisle from Susan and I. So now you know why I said, where are my feet? Yep, there's David. Phil's <laughs> like, you have to sit next to David today. Yeah, David. <laughs> Thank you. Well, one more round of applause, first. Yes, yes.